February 6, 2014, five divers cut a triangular hole in the ice on a river in the Plurdalen Valley of central Norway. This 35 meter wide river rises abruptly out of the ground from a strange pond known by locals as Plura. It is also home to a colorful cave many diving hobbyists love to descend before turning back and returning the way they came. Only if you are highly trained and experienced would you continue on a course that quickly plunges much deeper, becoming more narrow and difficult through ice cold pitch black water, eventually traversing several kilometers and ascending to a cave called the Snydnugelflugget. This traverse had only been attempted and completed one time before 2014. This is the story of the Plura Cave diving disaster. Driving over 15 hours through Finland, Sweden, and Norway, the group of five arrived at the Jord Brood Farm at 1 in the morning on the 6th of February. Kai Kankinen, Patrick Gronquist, Yari Horterinen, Visa Rantanen, and Yari Yu originally planned this trip for early January, but after having to reschedule several times, all were present on the morning of the 6th. Some of them knew each other well, having dived together more than a handful of times, but the main leaders of the group were Kakinen and Gronkvist. Being the most experienced divers, they were also a part of the first team who completed the traverse between the two known entrances of the Plura Cave. When first completed, it was a massive accomplishment in the diving community, but they wanted to return and establish the route more by completing a second traverse. The planned dive on the morning of the 6th was going to be just the second traverse between the two entrances and the first going in this direction. The fact that the cave reached a depth of over 130 meters made the dive one of extreme challenge. Including frigid water and several tight squeezes, the journey was not a simple one. After some much needed sleep, the group laid out the plan one last time a few hours before the dive. Splitting up into two groups, once both teams reached the other entrance, they would leave their equipment there, return the next morning, and dive back to the entrance they were currently at. Kankinen, Rantanen, and Yari Yu left in the van to take equipment to the Steinugelflaget cave entrance. Leaving equipment in preparation for their arrival, Rockvist and Hoterinen were left back at the Plura entrance, with the task of cutting an entrance hole in the ice with a chainsaw and preparing to get into the water. Estimating the dive would take over five hours, group two took their time to enter the water as they wanted the silt that kicked up from the first group to settle down, hoping the visibility would stay clear. Both groups used underwater scooters and closed circuit rebreather systems as they thought they were prepared for anything that came their way. An hour into Group 1's dive, Gronkvist and Horterinen reached the deepest part of the cave. Indicated by directional arrows pointed in opposite directions, they both turned off their scooters and began to coast to admire the sights of the cave. Writing the date and their initials with a waterproof marker on a small plastic plate that was fixed to the guideline, Horterinen then shouted something through his mask at Gronkvist. Unable to understand what he said, he gestured okay to him as they moved on through the passage. Being at a depth of 110 meters, they had advanced over 1.5 kilometers in distance from the entrance. At this point they knew they were closer to the Steinugelflaget exit and they were expecting to see the light coming from the exit after each turn. As the passage began to ascend, it made a 90 degree turn to the right while continuing through the narrowest restriction on the route. Still being the lead, Gronkvist made it completely through the restriction and turned around waiting for Arteranen to follow. Looking for his torchlight to come around the corner, it was after a few moments he saw light waving up and down through the restriction. This being a sign of distress, he quickly swam back, retreating to his friend. Now being positioned face to face with Hoterinen, he saw his scooter was stuck on an outcropping of rocks and began to yank him free. After a few moments of trying, he successfully got him free and swam backwards to make room for his friend. He then heard Hoterinen repeatedly shout, Give me the open circuit. Once he heard that, he knew the situation was serious. Giving his mouthpiece to Hoterinen, he took around 10 breaths from his bailout gas and then switched back to his own rebreather. Repeating this two or three times, Gronkvist then noticed that he didn't properly make the switch on his fourth attempt. After a moment, Gronkvist was forced to put the regulator back into his mouth, but at this point Hoterinen was inhaling water, and there was nothing he could do. To Gronkvist's horror, his friend died right in front of his eyes. Knowing he himself couldn't freak out in panic, he took a minute, forced himself to calm down, and slowly continued to make his way to the exit. He then looked at his dive computer to determine the duration of decompression stops required to make a safe ascent. The dive computer indicated that Gronkvist had to remain at depth for over 7 hours before being able to ascend safely to the surface. He stared at the screen in disbelief. Moments before the accident, the reading had been 120 minutes, but every minute spent at depth of 110 meters adds over 10 minutes of duration to the dive. Due to his friend's body blocking the way, he couldn't return the way he had come and therefore couldn't warn the second group of the death and subsequent blockade. 
The five-hour dive had quickly turned into an eight or nine-hour disaster. He then began swimming towards the exit, thinking about the second group who was certainly on their way to finding their deceased friend. The next hours of decompression stops were very lonely for Gronquist. The second team, consisting of Kai Kakinen, Beso Rantanen, and Yari Yu, were ready to begin their dive just after two in the afternoon, about two hours after group one. Rantanen was first, while Yari Yu and Kakinen followed. All attached to their underwater scooters, they reached an underwater man-made air chamber 20 minutes into the dive. Kakinen recognized the fact that they were carrying more bailout cylinders than during the maiden traverse, and they were moving incredibly slow. In the previous traverse, they had left bailout cylinders on both ends of the cave, and therefore needed to dive with fewer bailout cylinders attached to them. This time, however, Antonin insisted on bringing five large cylinders for different depths as a precautionary measure. Despite the warnings of Gronkvist and Kakinen that he may have to remove some of the equipment to fit through several restrictions that laid ahead, Rantanen persisted. Continuing on with the dive, after a longer than usual descent, Group 2 finally reached and passed through the deepest part of the cave, and were just a few turns away from their deceased friend. Rantanen knew something was amiss when he began to hear a faint beeping sound coming from ahead. Soon realizing that it was a distress signal from a breathing apparatus, he raced forward. Seeing one of his friends motionless and blocking the passage, he knew he couldn't look. He then switched into survival mode. Knowing he had to find a way around the body, he started to take off whatever gear he could in order to fit through the gap that was left. Seeing a light appear from behind him, he shouted through his mask that Hoteranen was dead and that a path around his body was not looking promising. What exactly happened next remains unclear as Kai Kakinen had no distinct recollection of the events due to shock and nitrogen narcosis, but he does recall that as he caught up with the REU, he knew everyone was spooked. Kakinen, not knowing the fate of Hoteranen, was confused by the flailing and peculiar movements Yariu was exhibiting. Trying to appease Yari, he pointed his light at the guideline, but then saw Yari switching from his rebreather to his bailout gas. Kakinen said, I tried to calm him down by talking to him and making sure that he wasn't trapped and that his bailout gas was on, but as the situation continued, I realized it couldn't be a failure in his rebreather. There was truly nothing he could do, and moments later, Yariu was dead. After a moment, Kakinen realized he had to swim on. Around the next corner, he saw the body of Hoiterinen, and next to it, the fins of Rantanen, who he saw kicking fiercely to get around the body. Kakinen then shouted to Rantanen that Yari Yu was dead, and screamed, Let's turn back. Rantanen heard him, but knew the way back was much longer than just pushing ahead, and Kakinen had to make up his mind quickly whether or not to wait for Rantanen to find a way through. Thinking that Rantanen was unlikely to make it, Kakinen turned back alone. As Kakinen swam back towards the entrance, he was certain that many of his fellow divers had died or were about to die, and he weighed up his own chance of survival. Determining that they were slim, he did have two rebreathers and only a little oxygen left, so he had some hope. The first decompression stops were made at roughly 100 meters in depth, and the stops not being longer than one minute were to become longer as the ascent continued. Irrespective of his dive computer indicating that he had to stop for an additional hour to decompress, he continued to ascend steadily. He estimated that he was more likely to run out of oxygen than to develop decompression sickness once at the surface. Having skipped a couple decompression stops during his earlier dives, he had never skipped this many at this much depth. After reaching the earlier mentioned man-made air chamber, he did feel some relief as he had an unlimited air supply should he decide to stay in the chamber. But after thinking about the others being dead and how there would be no one at the surface to alert rescue workers, no one would even know if he was still alive. Kakinen then decided to briefly stop before moving on and pushing for the surface. He estimated that he could make it to the entrance from the air chamber in about 20 minutes, but in the end, the final push to the exit took 45 minutes. On the other end of the cave, Patrick Gronkvist, who was a part of the first group, was still completing decompression stops, and unbeknownst to him, Vesa Rantanen was making his own decompression stops just behind him. Rantanen stayed close to the guideline, occasionally lying on the floor of the cave while waiting. To warm himself when he was cold, he placed his hands against the wall and kicked as hard as he could to stimulate blood flow. But being plagued by guilt for being unable to help Jari Yu, he racked his brain trying to think on how the tragedy even happened and if Patrick Gronkvist had also died. As the hours passed, he opened the valve on his last oxygen cylinder. It was too difficult to make out the pointer on the oxygen gauge and was not sure on how much oxygen he even had left. Knowing he had to make a dash for the surface, he began to rapidly ascend. At this point, he had been ascending at such a rate that he met up with Gronkvist and seeing a light coming from below, Gronkvist was relieved to see another human. Rantanen then told Gronkvist that the others had turned back at the sight of the dead body and that he wasn't sure if they made it out alive. Patrick Gronkvist, being finished with his decompression stops, rose to the surface a little past 9 o'clock in the evening. 
His dive had lasted eight and a half hours, or about three hours longer than expected, and he sat down in the Steinugel flag at exit to wait for Ratnan. As Ratnan finally exited the water an hour later, he was about 90 minutes too soon. Gronkvist and Ratnan then drove back to the Jordbrun farm, and after changing into dry clothes, they raised alarm with the Norwegian authorities. Afraid that no one would climb out of the hole, it was nearly two in the morning when they noticed that someone had switched on the lights in the van, and after running over, the pair found Kakanen laying on the floor. Assuming Gronkvist and Ratnan were locals, Kakanen thought he was the only man to make it out of the cave alive. Ecstatic to see his friends still breathing, the news of the other's deaths spread over the course of the morning hours. Once the police arrived, they launched a full investigation into the incident, as Gronkvist, Ratnan, and Kakanen were interviewed. Even though Rantanen was still being treated for decompression sickness, the local authorities began to mull over how to retrieve the bodies of the victims from the cave. Eventually deciding to call three experienced British cave divers to carry out the recovery, in late February of the same year, those divers descended into the cave but were unable to dislodge the bodies as they considered the operation too dangerous. Officials as a result decided to leave the bodies in the cave and impose a diving ban on the area. Then, on March 26th, a group of Finns gathered at the Steinugelflaget entrance. Knowing if the bodies were never recovered, this cave would be shut down forever, many divers who had not even met the victims lit their headlamps and illuminated the rocky chamber. The major recovery operation had been kept a secret from the authorities as they knew if they alerted them, the whole plan would be rejected. They prepared for weeks knowing that they'd only have one chance, and having several divers who had completed the full traverse before, they knew they had an advantage on the earlier attempted British rescue effort. 27 divers entered the cave, 17 Finns, and 10 Norwegians. Two groups of support divers worked at shallower levels at both ends of the traverse, while Gronkvis, Kakinen, and Sami Pakarenen once again dove to the deepest section of the cave to raise the bodies up. The victims were close to one another in the same place as the day of the accident, and it took a total of 101 dive hours to recover all the bodies. Once the mission was complete, the team notified authorities. The operation drew a lot of media publicity, and although the bodies were retrieved against official orders, the actions of the divers did not come under criticism. As they were carrying their gear out of the cave, roughly a dozen local residents came to help them, and after talking with authorities, the group was told that they would not face any charges for their illegal dive. Despite everything, Bronkvis, Rantanen, and Kakanen continue to enjoy the sport they love as the Pleura Cave is now open once again. Nobody has dared to make a new attempt at the full traverse, even though the group of survivors believe it's only a matter of time.